Buenos tardes. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at this fifth Futures Congress. Um, and I'm very pleased to acknowledge the very strong collaboration between United Kingdom and Chile. We have many science and innovation partnerships. I thought I would preface my remarks by just saying a little bit about what the job of being a chief scientific advisor to government means. So my job is to advise the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, and his cabinet on all aspects of science, engineering, technology, and social science for all of government policy. So that is a very broad job. So thinking about how to tackle a job that is so broad, the thing to do is to think about what government cares about. And what governments care about, and it doesn't matter whether it's the British government or the Chilean government or any other government, is us, the citizens. Our health, our well-being, our resilience, and our security. And the second thing, of course, that government cares about is the economy. Because without a good economy, it is difficult to have the best health, well-being, resilience, and security. And science, and I'm going to talk about science to encompass engineering, technology, and social science, is important to all of these things that government cares about. One of the things that I, is important in my advice is advice on emerging technologies, because I think it's true to say that we're going through an extraordinary industrial revolution at the moment. It's a revolution driven by information technology. Uh, the first phase of that was essentially the communication of knowledge. Uh, the internet and the World Wide Web created a modern library of Alexandria where now any of us as citizens can look in a search engine and find out about almost any topic. But we're moving to the second phase where almost every object that we interact with will have a silicon chip embedded in it, the world of the internet of things. And of course those mobile telephones that the majority of us are carrying are far more than just phones. Because they are geopositioned, they can tell us about our surroundings, they can help us to navigate, they help us to find out things. But imagine a world where our cars are part of the Internet of Things, our homes are part of the Internet of Things. It's a very different world. And that's why the importance of this topic this afternoon, which is to talk about science and social change. So we have produced reports recently on the Internet of Things, on financial technologies, and earlier this week I released a report for the government in the UK on distributed ledger technologies. All of these things have a big impact on society. So what I want to talk about in the next few minutes is firstly the effect that modern science and technology is having on society, but also the importance of the discussion about technology, so the effect of society on science. And sometimes people talk about technologies as though a particular technology is a good thing or a bad thing. But that's not sensible because since the beginning of human ingenuity and developing technologies, almost every technology has the potential to be used for good things or for bad things. And so when we're talking about technologies, and let's pick a controversial technology, which is genetic engineering, where people have strong opinions, the question is not actually whether genetic engineering is a good thing or a bad thing. It's what gene, what organism the engineering is being carried out in, and for what purpose. And only if we do that will we have the best discussions about technology. And this first slide illustrates some of these issues. So on the left, you see um, a Google Glass-enabled wedding. Now, I'm not sure I would want to go into my wedding uh, wearing a pair of Google Glasses, but this is someone who has chosen to live stream their wedding on the World Wide Web, something that would have been inconceivable just a few years ago. And on the right, you see someone protesting about those genetically modified genetic engineering that I was talking about. That revolution is quite extraordinary. So those mobile phones, increasingly uh, mobile watches, um, all of the social networking, so Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, um, Skype, which enables us to communicate uh, between continents at remarkably low cost if we have wireless access. 
those are changing human societies in quite unpredictable and novel ways. So we are able to maintain contact with people over very wide spaces, uh, watching my children's generation, they are staying in touch with their school friends distributed around the world in ways that were inconceivable for my generation. And these are very powerful tools indeed. But of course, there are then the unexpected consequences of technologies. And so we're seeing online the fact that increasingly people have multiple identities. They have an identity for Facebook. They have a Twitter identity. And I rather like this cartoon, which I think came from the New Yorker. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. They challenge what we understand by anonymity. Um, it challenges privacy. Um, and so these are all topics that are not just for scientists and technologists. They're topics for all of us in this room for society to discuss. And one of the, I think, the unexpected consequences of this era of information technology, of um, the ability to communicate, is that it has given everyone a voice. And so everyone can potentially tweet, everyone can blog, and of course that gives people, uh, it gives the democratic aspects of society new voices, but also it gives the terrorist, the person who is out to cause harm to democratic societies a voice as well. And we have to work out how to handle that. Privacy is something that is important to every one of us. Everyone has our own personal identity. There are things that we only talk about to our nearest and dearest family, our closest friends. But privacy is something that has the potential uh, to be quite hard to manage under certain circumstances. And here is an example, and I noticed in Santiago, as I drove around, that there are now bicycle schemes where you can hire bikes. Um, and this is a, a scheme that has been going in London for a number of years. And Transport for London, who are responsible, released anonymously the journeys that uh, cyclists were making. And so what you're looking at on this map is a cyclist journey around London, completely anonymous. Uh, but you can see almost certainly that this is someone who catches the train to St. Pancras every day. Uh, you can see that they work uh, somewhere in the Information Technology Centre of London. And then there are all these other visits that the person is paying. Now, I don't know who this individual is, and I don't care who this individual is. But you can imagine, from this type of geopositioning information, it should be possible for someone to work out, maybe with a fair degree of accuracy, who's riding that bicycle. And so we have to think that information about ourselves has the potential, even when released anonymously, to reveal something about our identity. It also has the potential to change the workplace very dramatically. Uh, so instead of groups of people flying around the world, and of course I have to say that there is no easy substitute for standing in a room with all of you, though I'm also aware that this is being web-streamed and there are many people outside this room who suddenly have access to this Congress. But it does potentially mean that we can work together in ways that were inconceivable before. And here, a video wall uh, is perhaps the next best thing to being physically in the same room. And moving to that world of the Internet of Things, we're moving to a world where our refrigerator has a silicon chip in it. Um, our air conditioning, our heating can be controlled using smart controls in ways that optimize our use of energy. And I think everyone accepts we must use energy less and more efficiently. Um, we're moving to a world where um, a robot potentially has the opportunity to clear a house. Um, so it's a very different world of that Internet of Things. Um, this is the information from a uh, smart meter in a house. And so this is the information uh, that is being collected. Um, and you can see um, how uh, the refrigerator is operating. And you can imagine if someone could get access to this information, then if they wanted to burgle this house, it is fairly obvious when to go in. Um, but equally, this is very important, because if we want to optimize the way we use energy, then we have to avoid the peaks in energy consumption. And so you can see on the right hand of this figure, when someone comes home, uh, they switch on their air conditioning, uh, they charge their car, because this is someone who has an electric car, and you see the spike in energy consumption in the evening. 
And it is in our interests, if we're to minimize the amount of power we need to generate, to even out our usage of energy throughout the day. And so a smart meter potentially has the opportunity to only charge the car at a time when other electricity use is low and when market signals tell it it's the cheapest time to charge your car. And again, looking at the effect of science on society, uh, part of my job is to look into the future. And so we've been doing a project on what cities will look like in 50 years' time. And what does a future city look like? Um, and all of the signs are that we will change the way we move around cities and increasingly move to a much smaller scale, autonomously driven, low-carbon personal transport. Although I think it's likely, and I hope as a doctor, that the bicycle and walking around will remain popular. And we'll see autonomous systems, drones, monitoring our infrastructure, such as electricity cables, for damage. The view that we have of the city is as much underground as it is above ground. And so the streets of London and I suspect the streets of Santiago are as complicated, if not more complicated, underground. We'll be managing our buildings, managing the complexity of our infrastructure. But all of this creates uh, new vulnerabilities. And of course, in a world which is connected together on the internet, then the issues of cybersecurity become absolutely critical. And so a building which in the past would have been dependent on its energy supply is now potentially vulnerable to cyber attack. And our reliance on our infrastructure, on power networks, has become almost total. And just finishing off on the effects of science on society, there are all sorts of new tools for government. So we've been having meetings here to talk about the power of satellite remote monitoring to monitor fisheries, to make sure that illegal fishing is removed, to monitor mountainous areas, for example, to learn more about the geology, to monitor in the case of earthquakes, where satellite information can give you very quick understanding of what's changed before and after a natural disaster. Um, and in the UK, we've developed a mapping system called Resilience Direct, which combines information about uh, geography with where people live, uh, with uh, events, be it a, a traffic accident or some major flooding disaster. Um, and data analytics as a way of government delivering its policy better enables taxes to be collected more effectively, but also benefits to be delivered in a better and more effective fashion. But now let's switch briefly and just look at it from the other perspective. And there are not many scientists in a government in the United Kingdom, elected politicians, and people sometimes say to me, my scientific colleagues, wouldn't it be so much better if all of the people in Parliament knew more science? But I have to turn around to them and say, well, wouldn't it be better if scientists knew more about politics? Because my job as a scientific advisor is actually much easier than the job of being a politician. So politicians make policies. They decide how particular things should be done. They make laws. And when a politician is making policy, they look through three particular lenses. And the first lens they look through is the lens, what do I know about X or Y? What is the evidence? And that's where a scientific advisor comes in. The second lens they look through is the lens of delivery. So if I make a policy uh, to impose, for example, a particular tax, is it a deliverable policy? Because the best policy in the world that cannot be delivered is not a good policy at all. And the third lens that they look through is the lens of their human values, of their political beliefs, their political party, their social values, their personal values, for example, their religious values, their ethical values. And it's only by looking through all three of those lenses that policymakers come up with their policies. So they think if they're politicians about what does my electorate think? And so science is part of the evidence and it's often a very important part of the evidence, but it's not the only thing that politicians think about. Turning around now to look at society. Innovation, as I've indicated, poses new opportunities. It poses new threats. And these are the ways, I think, five ways in which society, and that's all of us, uh, need to think and some of the issues that arise. So the first principle is the question of equity or fairness, and that is, an innovation, be it a new antibiotic or a new vaccine, 
is that going to be fairly available? And of course, there's a challenge before that even, which is that in the face of an infection that mainly affects poor people in the world, will a vaccine be developed in the first place? And so the issue there is not whether the technology is accepted or not, it's whether it's available. And therefore we have discussions about fairness in distribution. The second example is where scientific advances meet ethical and religious values. So for example, stem cell technologies are an area where there are strong religious views and those religious views then have to be taken against the scientific opportunities. And ultimately, that is a challenge that has to be resolved by lawmakers. And so when a technology has become available for dealing with a particular severe inherited disease called mitochondrial disease, a very smart regulator in the United Kingdom called the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority reviewed the science, it debated the subject with the public, and then ultimately there were free votes in the Houses of Parliament in the UK to make the decision which was to allow it to go ahead in a regulated fashion. The third area is when the benefits from a technology are in one place, but the risks are seen to be in another. And so technology development's infrastructure often falls into that category. You get a big engineering facility, a power station, let's say, built in your neighborhood, and the benefits from it, the power, go to other parts of the country. And so that's another type of challenge where there may be uh, different views depending on the locality of the innovation then there's the whole question of unintended consequences. So no one could have imagined, really, when the internet was developed, when the World Wide Web was developed, what some of the potential consequences we're having to think about would be. And then there are the new challenges posed by things such as drones, which is drones have benefit, uh, but they don't have a benefit until they, they fly into the pathway of a civilian or indeed a military airliner. And so what I would argue is, and this is the example I talked about, the Human Fertility and Embryology Authority, it's very important that we have the public discussion, and that's why meetings like this are so important. So that the scientists and the engineers can say, okay, this is what the science and technology offers, but how we use technology is up to all of us. And what we need is evidence, and we need very clear discussion. And sometimes people deliberately confuse the science discussions from the values discussions. So rather than saying, for example, that we don't like embryology techniques because we have strong religious views about it, they say there is something wrong with the science itself. And I don't think that's a good way of resolving the discussions. So we have to work together and have a clear debate. Science, engineering, technology, and social science are very important to governments around the world. And I would argue that scientific advice in the context of government is not an optional extra. It's absolutely essential. And I think the challenge for all of us is to get the best evidence into the policymaking process, but to recognize that new technologies will bring new issues for society. And the great thing about meetings like this is that we have the opportunity to look forward and to debate some of those ethical issues. But I think always recognizing that we shouldn't think about a technology as a singular thing. Any technology has both good and bad potentials. And of course, increasingly, we live in a world where technologies are converging. So new materials are being linked to biology, are being linked to the internet, and that's going to change the world in which we live. Thank you for your attention.